OCN Word of God to the World And welcome to your program, Jeremiah 29.11. And today we're going to be teaching about financial wisdom in the area of setting goals. Amen. 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 And Dexter and I are so blessed to be able to bring you this program. And I'm just going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. And we ask you, Father to let your Holy Spirit guide us as we learned about making and setting financial goals, goals that would accomplish the purposes of your kingdom and your, and your purposes for our lives and for our perfect will so that we may not be a burden to others and a blessing to the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So Dexter, setting goals. Amen. Well, I thought we'd, we'd kind of step back, Marisol, and talk just more in depth about setting goals um, from a financial wisdom perspective for our future and the importance of that. And I just want to reiterate human nature for a second, which is, listen, if in today's world with all the temptations of the world, all the advertising, all the, I want a nicer car, I want nicer clothes, I want nicer shoes, I want more shoes, I want whatever. With all that pressure in the world, um, most of us are drawn to it because that's what we see every day. We see the world. You just, you can't drive around without seeing the billboards. You can't turn on TV without seeing the commercials. You, you, you see it everywhere you go. So knowing that the temptations of the world are surrounding us at all times, we also know that the way of Americans is make your money and spend it. And then if you want something, Marisol, what do you do? You take out your credit card, you hand it to the person, you get your new TV, you get your new furniture, you get your new whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Each time. And what happens then when you have to pay it off? You may not have the money. And you may end up with credit card debt, right? Mm -hmm. And you may end up with the fact that you have to pay high interest rates on it. And it may be, it's very possible if we all look back in our lives, there's a period even where we got maybe more money, a raise, or even a bonus, but it's amazing how it disappeared very quickly. We had a little bit more money, we get a raise, and we spend it. It's human nature. Over and over again, we seem to do that. So, the point about God's way is God's financial wisdom will teach us to save, to tithe, and to invest for the future. But in order to do that, what really helps in our human nature, and Marisol and I have found this, is to set specific goals of what we want to save for. And that's what we want to talk more about. Listen, the Bible says it's not good to have debt. It says, if you have debt, you're a slave to whoever owns your debt. You're a slave to them. And so the Bible te teaches a principle of not incurring debt to be making your purchases. Because of that, the old-fashioned way my parents had, and probably the parents before them had, was save money, 
and then buy what you want to buy. A car, my parents would save money and then pay for the car with cash. My parents would save money and buy furniture. My parents would save money and then send us to college. It was all about a being prudent and wise in your financial decisions by saving for what you want to have a goal to purchase. And the point of all this is, listen, if I look at why I want to save money, there's many reasons. One is, what happens if an emergency happens, Marisol, and you don't have any money saved? You're in big trouble. You get evicted if you can't pay your rent. And what if your car broke down? You're in big trouble because you can't fix it and you can't go to work. You don't have the cash to fix it, right? Right. So then you put the credit card down and then you have interest rate on it and you get in this debt spiral, right? So the first thing is, from a wisdom perspective, is the emergency fund. You know, that should be a minimum of three months, more likely six months, and for some people even a higher amount of their living expenses put aside. So that when the emergencies come, which they do in everyone's life, we are not in a position where we need to be a burden to others, right, Marissa? Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say about not being a burden to others? Not to be a burden to others, the Apostle Paul said. That's right. And so in order to do that, we have to be financially wise. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, again, we look at these seeds that God gives us, we can't just take the seeds and spend them frivolously on the lustful desires of our eyes. We need to actually be wise with them and plant them so they can grow, be invested, and be available when they, they're needed. Marisol gave the example last time, remember, of the necklace that the Lord asked you to save to give to someone, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's an example. You set things aside so that they're there when the Lord wants to use them. And that includes our financial resources. So an emergency fund is really essential. It's one of the earliest things that we should be setting aside money for. Um, what is this about? Well, maybe what you call the sacrificial living. In other words, instead of living for all the desires of the world, we live for financial wisdom in the kingdom of God and for God's desires. Setting money aside for those and planting those seeds for the future. So after um, the emergency fund, Marisol, everyone, when they're young, in fact, a lot of people today, um, there's a lot of employers, even Starbucks, um, in and out, I forget all the places that people were telling me. Oh, um, AT and T, Comcast. You know, they have pension funds, 401ks for their employees. Mm -hmm. And when you invest, they put in a matching amount. So everyone should be setting aside that money from a very young age for your future to be able to retire, go to your ministry when you're older, etc. And we talked about it, but if you don't set a goal for that, this is the point of all this. You've got to first set a goal. We set our goals together, right, Marisol? And then we say, we want to save money for this. We want to save money for that. We want to save money to invest. And when we do that, then we stick to it. Why? Because we make each other be held accountable to it, right? Sometimes we don't like it when we want to buy something and we're like, oh, can I buy this? And we're like, you know, there's some flexibility in it. Let's grant that. But as a whole, if you have a goal and a set amount you want to save for, you're much and someone that you're accountable to, you're much more likely in the kingdom to actually execute that goal. Why do we say that? Because we've we've had some people that will start to set aside money, and every time the TV goes on sale or something they really want goes on sale, they spend it just like that. There's no self-discipline. So if you don't have a goal and you don't have a commitment to stick to it, you're going to fall back into the same old patterns of being more and more in debt and fall more and more behind and have difficulty with your living expenses. Okay, um, so primary driver here is to avoid debt, Marisol, mm -hmm. right? So those credit card transactions, so easy to do, hand in the credit card, go buy the new TV, because, well, it's 4K. Well, maybe now it's 8K. Soon it will be 16K. And we need that new, new TV. And if they're going to use their credit card, they need to pay it off at the end of the month. All of the balance. Oh. Yes. That's financial wisdom. Because credit card debt, it averages, I don't know, 18, 21%. Depends on your credit rating. But it's extraordinarily high. So 
I want to address for a second, what if you're in debt, Marisol? What should you do? What if you have a lot of credit card debt that uh, you didn't pay off at the end of the month? What if you have car loans? What if you have a mortgage? What if you have a shortage of money? What do you start doing? What, do you, what can you do? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to pay for your mortgage because you need a house to live. Right. But then you organize your credit cards and you see which one you owe the most to the least. And the highest interest rate. And the highest interest rate. And you pay those off first. And you, the ones that you owe the least, right, you pay it off first. Yep. And then when you finish paying that, the money that you paid towards that one, you put towards the next one, and the next one. And, and it snowballs, actually. And then you don't buy anything. Because if you're like me, and like a lot of people in the U.S., you can go shopping in your closet. <laughs> I go shopping in my closet all the time, don't I, Dexter? Yeah, because the reality is, as Americans, we have more than we need. Than of, we need. For, of most of us have pretty much anything. But there's a principle Marisol was talking about, which is pay off your credit cards. If you have a revolving line of, on a credit card and you have 21% interest, you can barely even keep up with the interest payments. So you need to pay off those balances. And this is where sacrificial living comes in. Instead of going out to eat as frequently, instead of buying those discretionary items, by the way, they're called discretionary for a reason, Right? Tiffany's, all these places, Bloomingdale's, most of that stuff is discretionary. You don't, you and I don't need it. Um, but to, so those items are what get us in trouble. But if you cut back on all those and just buy the essentials that you need, you know, bread, milk, eggs, whatever you eat, whatever your essentials are, fruit, vegetables, whatever you eat, salad, buy the essentials, don't go out to eat, and make that sacrifice and the commitment to make a sacrifice. But here's the thing. I think that the longer we do that, the more it can become a lifestyle of not being drawn into the world system and the devil's temptation and learning to live with less and learning to have more cash flow and learning then to be blessed and be able to put more, invest more into the kingdom. More tithing, more everything. So. The beauty of this is, though, pay off the highest interest rate and the lowest balance. Why did Marisol say that? Well, it's like a reward, and plus that monthly payment now goes away on that credit card because you paid it off completely. Then you go to the next one with a high interest rate, the next highest balance, and you pay that off. That way you get the rewards more quickly, and it motivates you to do more. Because in human nature, motivation is you see the results. Like the Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, right, Marisol? Mm -hmm. If you pick the highest balance and you try to pay that off, you're going to get kind of frustrated, right? The little dent you make into it. But if you start with the lower balances with high interest rate, you see the effects of it. And I can tell you that from my own life, it works. It's rewarding and the Lord blesses you because you're obeying his commandments of not being in debt. And therefore, he can bless everything that you're doing more. Okay, so the order really is normally credit cards, then personal loans, then your car, pay that off. Um, the last thing you usually pay off is your home mortgage, because let's face it, you can't really just pay that off immediately. Um, and it has a benefit of being the lowest interest rate usually. But they can get a 15-year loan if they can. Yeah. And it has the advantage of being a tax deduction. Whereas these others are not tax deductions. Your car, your credit card, your personal loans, even home equity lines right now are no longer tax deductions for most of them when you borrow on your home. The one thing that still is is your home mortgage. So you get tax savings on that, which helps. And you have the lowest interest rate on that, which helps. And you're have equity being built up, Lord willing, in a home, which helps. So, but that would be the last one you would tackle if you want to completely obey the biblical principles of being debt free, which is nice to do. Because guess what? You'll find out if you don't have any debt, you have a lot more positive cash flow if you can learn to control your spending on discretionary items. 
you'll have a lot more flexibility in what you can do in life and be a blessing to others in the kingdom when God calls you to. And by the way, God sees that obedience and he will call you and then you'll get rewards for being a blessing to others. Okay. Um, the goal of saving for retirement beyond the 401k, Marisol. Why do we say that? Well, one of our principal things for retirement, right? If you have a 401k or a pension at work and your social security, right? Mm -hmm. That's what most people look at for retirement. Well, why not be prudent and have other investment vehicles for retirement, like rental real estate, which is one of our favorites. Rental real estate has the advantage of low interest rates. Real estate prices usually go up, which right now, given the global economy, we're likely to stay in low interest rates for an extended period. And one of the assets that benefits the most in that, believe it or not, is real estate. Um, and because of that, it's a good investment. Now, in a deep recession, nothing escapes prices going down, including real estate. We all understand that. But, but it's something tangible. And if you have the money set aside, and what if real estate prices go down in a recession, what can you then buy, Marisol? Gold. Well, no, real estate. Real estate? When the prices are down. Okay. Why? Because then you're going to have appreciate, more appreciation in it. In fact, I think it's um, quite a few real estate investors, including Donald Trump, not all of you may be a fan of his, but God bless our president, um, has made a point in life that you make money in real estate not by the amount of appreciation you have after you buy it, but by buying at a better low price. So finding the undervalued assets. And during a recession, if you have the money set aside, you can invest more in the stock market, if that's your choice. You can invest when the stocks go down, like they've been going down this week. You can invest in real estate when the prices go down and have a rental real estate property that pays a much higher return. Because let's face it, if you can get $1,000 rent a month off of a property and you can pay $100,000 for it, that's a 10% return. But what if you can buy it for $80,000? Well, that's a 12.5% return. So the lower the price you pay, the better your cash flow return on the rental income. And that's why it's important when you want to buy a house, when you're going to go buy a car, that you play Mr. and Mrs. Disinterested. Oh, you mean in the purchase itself? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to buy a car, they'll, they'll, they have tactics where they say, what do you want your monthly payment to be? And then they put you in a six-year or even if we've seen as much as seven-year loan. And you're underwater on the loan the whole time, by the way, which means the value of the car is much less than what you owe on it. Um, and they are notorious for doing that, car salesmen. Well, Marisol and I are pretty bad. If we go buy a car, um, we play kind of, I don't know if that expression He's is a nice one. I'm the one that doesn't good like cop, it. Good cop, bad cop. One of us is like, I love oh, saying. maybe I'm interested, and the other one's like, no, I, I'm, I, I'm oh, interested. Oh, no, that's I don't like it. That price is way too high, and it's too high. It's too I'm expensive. not interested in paying that price. It's too expensive. Let's go. And I can tell you, Consistently, we typically walk away, and the last time we walked away, we went to eat lunch around the corner. Sure enough, the sales manager called and gave us the lower price, which is very little profit for the dealer, but means that we saved, well, thousands of dollars, actually, on the purchase. And therefore, guess what? Everything's cheaper. Your taxes on it are cheaper. Your, if you do have a monthly payment, it's cheaper. Everything is cheaper on it. And if you ever sell it later, you're more likely to have a gain versus if you overpay for the car. And the guy says, well, you're not going to buy the car for a $30 difference? And I'm like, no, we're not. No, she did. And we were starting to walk away. So, uh, all right. All right, all right. All right. All right. It was $50, by the 50. way. We were $50 apart. And we just said, no. No, I'm not Took buying it. Of it and we I don't need it. Out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> why? Because really, it's God's seeds. And I want to shepherd them and make the most of them. And that means if I need a car, for transportation for my job, then I need a car. Yes. 
but I'm not going to overpay for it. And there's many who make wise decisions of buying like two-year-old cars or three-year-old cars because most of the appreciation happens in the earliest one, two years, three years. So when you buy a good quality car that has a good report of record for not having a high maintenance cost, which they have records of that, you can find that all over the internet, you can find the cars that have low maintenance costs, and if you buy that car a couple years old, you've saved a lot of money. Most of the depreciation the original buyers had. Um, what we like to do too is um, no, no cost leases where all we pay is tax, title, and license, so, but no fees on top of that. And, and we like to keep our payments around $250 to $280 a month for that. And those are nice cars. Um, so we don't have to pay any maintenance on them. All maintenance is covered. You can go to car dealers today. They'll, they'll cover your oil changes for the three years, and that's about all you have. That's about it. During the initial three years, you don't have any maintenance costs. And so you save a lot of money that way versus when you have an older car and you have high maintenance costs. Okay. But we a house. have five minutes. A house. Let's talk about that. It's a big deal. It's an American dream to have a house. But you can't buy a house if you don't save for the down payment. And it takes that discipline to save for the down payment. And Dexter, what is it that, that mortgage insurance that you pay if you don't give? If you have 20% down payment, you don't have the mortgage insurance pay right. payments to make in addition. So That's you right. have to make sure you have 20% so you don't pay that mortgage insurance? Yeah, which is to protect the banks from people defaulting if you pay less than 20%. And it's a lot of money. Yeah, it is each month. But you can avoid that by having a 20% down payment. And that's just financial wisdom. And, but, again, if you set a goal with your spouse or whoever to buy a house and you start setting the money aside and set an amount you're going to set aside every month and you stay with it, then you know what? I think God blesses that, gives you self-control as a blessing when you ask him for it, which I, I ask for self-control, and he blesses you in that endeavor to save the money. But you have to also say no to the temptations when they come. And you have to be accountable to someone that will help you say no sometimes. That's just the way it is. And you don't buy a house you cannot afford. But so many people are house poor. They spend all their money on their house. You shouldn't buy a house that you can't afford. Right. You should budget. Budgeting is critical. You need to know what your income are and your expenses. You can't just have this dream that it's going to work out. You have to know your limitations. You can't just keep buying things and hoping it works out because you get in worse and worse trouble. You have to be financially prudent and set a budget. And that budget then allows you to set aside savings. And that savings allows you then to have more flexibility to buy those things when you need to without debt or with a minimal amount of debt. And this is what this is about. Because if you don't have debt, your income minus your expenses is a much higher amount. Much of a person's monthly expenses are going to pay off debt. An extraordinary amount. So if you have minimized your debt, you have a lot more income at the end of each month to save and do the things we're talking about. Which is a biblical principle, so un-American. But if we commit to it and start doing it, God will bless it. So I want to pray about that. Yes. Lord, you know, I want to have financial wisdom in setting goals. And I want these goals to be in accord with your will for my life. I don't want to set goals just to set goals. So I ask you to give me financial wisdom and lead me in what goals to set. In what order to set those goals. So if I don't have an emergency fund, help me to set yes. that goal and help me to have self-control. I ask your Holy Spirit to take over. I crucify my flesh yes. and the desires of the flesh. I crucify you yes. and I surrender and release myself yes. to be led by you and by the fruit of the Spirit, which includes self-control. I ask you to take over in this area of my life with financial wisdom and self-control, Father. Mm -hmm. And my eyes... Anoint them to desire the things of the kingdom and to take my eyes off all the desires of the world and the lusts of the world that would entrap me and tempt me. And I ask you to keep them focused on the long term and your goals for my life. And those eyes now to see the kingdom in everything that I do, including having financial wisdom. 
And by the way, Lord, if you want a house, you ask the Lord to set the path for getting that house each step of the yes. way. And then you stick to it and ask the Lord to bless it. And, you know, the Lord will even help you find that house as he did with us. The Lord literally picked out our house. We tried to go around it and buy other houses. Yes. But luckily we had prayed that only his perfect will would be done. So he intervened through different people to stop us from buying the wrong house. Even our real estate agent. Even our real estate agent, we told him, put in an offer, and he refused. No, I don't like that As house. God is my witness. Well, I mean, it had a, a legal suit against the HOA. And, and the Lord used him to say, no, I don't feel comfortable with this. And we're like, well, we can live with that risk. He's like, no. And how many real estate agents say no to you about buying a house where they're going to get a commission? But God even used that real estate agent because we had committed to his perfect will, even with regard to buying a house. So if you set your goals in accordance with God's wisdom, we ask, Father, that you take over with those goals Plant them in our minds and our hearts, and anything that is not of you, we crucify and we cast away from our minds and our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We break covenant with it, asking now to lead us in your perfect will of these financial goals, and then give us the self-control and discipline, Holy Spirit, help us with that every month to meet those goals in the name of Jesus. Amen. This has been your program, Jeremiah 2911, with your host, Dr. Marisa Pulser, and my beloved husband, Reverend Dexter Pulser. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Amen.